The movie begins with an emergency police call to Team 91. The officer on the other end keeps calling the unit to ask if they need assistance. After quite a while, a woman replies, telling the anxious officer on the other end that they do not need assistance and everything is under control. We see a badly mutilated face of a lifeless corpse before the scene cuts out. We are introduced to a town amidst the festive Christmas season. Our focus shifts to a rather desolate police station adorned with numerous posters featuring missing individuals. The station is very quiet, almost eerily so. An elderly gentleman named Winston diligently tidies up the place, seemingly the sole occupant. It is raining outside, with thunder crackling every now and then. Just as Winston goes about his business, a light bulb overhead bursts, startling him, followed by the creaking sound of a door swinging open. He hears strange whimpering noises, intrigued. He investigates the disturbance and is met with an unexpected sight. A woman is standing there, visibly distressed and shedding tears. She's soaked from head to toe in the pouring rain and her hands are ominously stained with blood. She implores the scared Winston to summon Sheriff Hudson. The man calls the officer. Promptly, Sheriff Hudson arrives on the scene, responding to the urgent call. Winston, clearly shaken, reflects on the unsettling encounter. He is stuttering and looks extremely troubled with what he has experienced. With a reassuring demeanor, Sheriff Hudson advises Winston to head home, assuring him that all will be sorted out and put to rest. As he leaves, the sheriff calls out, asking him to thank his wife for the wonderful cookies she made for her and the team. Finally, Winston gets a little calmer and leaves with a smile. Then, Sheriff Hudson arms herself and decides to approach the strange woman, attempting to open a dialogue. She asks the woman if she would like a drink after taking in her distressed demeanor, but the woman declines. Curiosity in her eyes, Hudson gently inquires about the reason for her visit to the police station. The woman, initially silent, takes a moment before revealing that she's here to report a missing person. Sheriff Hudson is keen to assist and asks who it is. The woman, instead of verbally responding, rises from her chair and walks towards the pinboard, adorned with a multitude of missing persons posters. Her eyes scan the array of faces, and then she turns to Hudson, questioning if any of them have been found. In response, Sheriff Hudson explains the harsh reality of countless people going missing each year, some vanishing without a trace. As Hudson takes notes, the woman brings up the name Joey Gonzalez, a missing child. The mere mention causes Hudson to break the pencil lead, showing a hint of recognition. Hudson asks if the woman knows Joey Gonzalez. The woman, with a distant look, mentions that she can still hear the faint melody of music and the jingling of spare change in Joey's pockets. She adds cryptically that he got too close. Intrigued by this enigmatic statement, Sheriff Hudson probes further, asking what it is that he got close to. The woman in turn questions Hudson if she can hear it, leaving a sense of mystery hanging in the air. The scene then shifts to a young boy named Joey, who is looking through the refrigerator for ice cream. When he finds the box empty, he rushes to his mom, informing her that there's no more ice cream. His mother tells him that he should not eat sweets before dinner. Despite the household rule of no sweets before dinner, temptation takes hold of Joey when he spots a candy jar just outside. Defying the rule, he attempts to sneak a treat. Before he can get one out, in a strange turn of events, the TV flickers to life on its own, showcasing a lively animated advert for ice cream. The advert has a jingling music in the background. Unnerved, Joey switches off the TV, only to be greeted by the same jingle echoing from outside. Intrigued, he decides to investigate leading him to discover an ice cream truck conveniently parked right in front of his house. Approaching the truck with anticipation, Joey notices a mysterious hand holding a clown mask. Fearlessly, he expresses his desire for ice cream, and to his surprise, the person flips the mask, revealing a rather somber expression. Despite the unsettling moment, Joey is handed a scoop of ice cream, and with a smile, he happily starts making his way back home. However, just as he takes a few steps, the hand taps him on the shoulder, Turning around, he finds the hand outstretched, asking for money. Joey explains that he doesn't have money and suggests asking his mom. Strangely, the hand gestures for him not to go and starts stretching towards him. Upon contact, a chilling transformation occurs. Joey begins to freeze, and blood inexplicably oozes from the ice cream, leaving a haunting and mysterious scene in its wake. In the aftermath of this chilling encounter, a terrifying face materializes in the window of the ice cream truck. Abruptly, the window slams shut, and the ice cream truck hastily departs. To Joey's dismay, he realizes he's trapped inside a freezer within the moving vehicle, and an unsettling figure resembling the clown emerges to haunt him. Back at the police station, Sheriff Hudson expresses skepticism, 
questioning the woman about the credibility of such a story. Undeterred, the woman calmly responds that Joey believed, emphasizing the gravity of the situation. Frustrated, Hudson urges her to reveal the identity of the person she's here to report. The woman cryptically mentions Tammy, another missing person. She tells Hudson about how it was a classic case of a mistaken identity and a strange voice that used to call her. The scene then cuts to Tammy Wright, a 23-year-old who is enjoying her life. She is wearing headphones that are blasting music and is dancing in the kitchen. A disquieting presence lurks behind her, but when she senses it and turns around, there's no one in sight. Just then, Tammy receives a call from her estranged mother, disclosing the long duration of time since they last spoke. Her mother, with genuine concern, admits to being clueless about Tammy's whereabouts and urges her to consider coming back home. Tears begin to roll down her face after hearing her mother's voice. However, instead of replying, Tammy hangs up and decides to go back to her room. Just as she leaves, an eerie occurrence unfolds. The table lamps nearby begin flickering ominously. Some time later, we see Tammy sprawled on her sofa, eating snacks and deciding on the channel that she would be watching. She comes across an intriguing cake commercial. As she is engrossed in the advert, the lights start flickering. All of a sudden, the TV signal cuts off. She groans and rushes to move the antenna, but to no avail. With no other choice left, she decides to busy herself, playing games and cleaning the house. Tired after a long day, she finally dozes off. Later that night, Tammy is peacefully asleep on the couch when she jolts awake, finding herself standing in front of another version of herself. This doppelganger unsettlingly hands her a phone, and the scenario takes a horrifying turn as the house appears to be engulfed in flames. Tammy screams awake, and the horrific ordeal proves to be just a figment of Tammy's imagination. As she tries to shake off the uncanny dream, the TV inexplicably turns on by itself. Intrigued, she tunes in and stumbles upon a commercial, advertising a free dating network. Feeling adventurous, Tammy decides to give it a shot. Dialing the provided number, she engages in a conversation with a seemingly nervous man on the other end. When asked if she lives alone, Tammy lies, claiming she resides with her mom and dad in the adjoining room. Detecting the man's unease, Tammy decides to have some fun, attempting to seduce him with suggestive noises. After a while of fooling around, she finds the man on the other end goes silent. She calls out to him, but to her surprise, the man remains unresponsive, only offering a strange piece of advice about maintaining a safe distance from the screen for the sake of her eyes. Alarmed by this odd shift, Tammy sits up and turns off the TV, demanding the man to repeat his statement. Instead of clarity, the man cryptically speaks of knowing the sins she committed and issues a chilling warning about the impending consequence of going to hell. Disturbed, Tammy hastily disconnects the call. The lights in her house flicker once more, adding an eerie layer to the mysterious events unfolding around her. The poor woman breathes hard, scared of what she just encountered. However, Tammy is stirred from her perplexing interaction with the mysterious caller as she hears her mom's voice emanating from the other room. Scared, she ventures into the room and is petrified to find her mom seated there. To Tammy's surprise, her mom keeps shouting and praying about the profound emotions tied to someone missing and the elation of rediscovering them. As Tammy absorbs this cryptic conversation, the atmosphere becomes increasingly eerie. She lives alone so how could her mother be there? The terrified woman looks on at her mother, who suddenly goes silent and slowly looks up, eerily smiling at her. The lights start flickering, and in the blink of an eye, her mom vanishes from the room. The sudden jarring ring of the phone sends shivers down Tammy's spine. She screams, and fearing for her safety, hastily grabs a knife. With trepidation, she cautiously approaches the ringing phone. Upon answering, she finds that it is none other than her mom. The woman on the other side is seemingly worried and inquires if Tammy is alright. Overwhelmed and distressed, Tammy drops the phone, only to be met with the sinister laughter of the mysterious man. Suddenly, in a terrifying twist, an otherworldly light emanates from her TV, enveloping Tammy and transporting her into the very depths of the television itself. The last words that escape her lips are an apology and a plea for help. We see her mother, back in her home, longing for her missing daughter's return. Back at the police station, the ringing telephone catches the attention of both the woman and Sheriff Hudson. The woman prompts Hudson to answer it. Hudson picks up the receiver and calmly addresses the caller, attributing the disturbance to a mere storm. She advises them to stay inside, lock their doors, and not let their imaginations run wild. As she puts down the phone, she sees the woman back in front of the missing posters. The woman, seemingly familiar with the caller, remarks on Mrs. Francis's tendency to fear things that aren't real. Sheriff Hudson is taken aback by this. She inquires how the woman knows the person she was just speaking to, 
and presses for information about her identity. In response, the woman vaguely suggests that sometimes the answers are right in front of everyone, yet they remain oblivious to the true reality surrounding them. The sheriff is lost on what to say anymore. The woman then points to another picture, commenting that she was there, all alone. If only they had looked closer. The scene then shifts to a custodian, who immerses himself in the soothing strains of classical music from his Walkman, as he diligently goes about mopping the floor. All of a sudden, his chore is interrupted by the desperate cries of a girl in need of help. Pausing his work, he goes to the window and looks out. The terrified shrieks continue and the girl keeps asking for help, begging anyone who is hearing to not let her pass away. Putting aside his duties, he follows the distressing sounds and arrives at a miniature town model. The source of the screams becomes apparent as he discovers two tiny injured girls within the model. One of them identifies as Leela, the other clutching a can of gasoline. Tragically, the second girl succumbs to weakness, collapsing in Leela's arms and meeting her demise. The custodian looks at the unfolding events in disbelief. Undeterred, Leela proceeds to pour the gasoline onto the miniature town model. As she does this, it becomes clear that there are many other tiny figures, resembling dolls, populating the town. All of them, eerily lifelike, begin to follow Leela and assemble in front of her. As Leela prepares to ignite a flare, an unexpected twist occurs. All the tiny people vanish, leaving Leela bewildered and frightened. Startled, she falls, and the lit flare in her hands also falls with her. The scene cuts abruptly. The custodian, witnessing the aftermath, picks up Leela and gently places her back into the miniature town model. The other vanished figures also reassemble, one by one. They approach the lit flare and pick it up, seemingly animated by an otherworldly force. These tiny figures then proceed to enact a haunting sequence. They set the miniature town on fire. One by one all the houses burn down. The custodian watches all this happen, yet he doesn't do anything. As the man departs, the scene concludes with the miniature town engulfed in flames and a helpless Leela lying in there. Back at the police station, the woman ambiguously asserts that evil hides in tiny places. Sheriff Hudson, very unsettled by the eerie stories she's been recounting, demands to know how she's privy to all this information. Police officers spend years chasing leads in such cases. In response, the woman simply states that she knows it to be true. Hudson, still skeptical, challenges her narrative, insisting that a person doesn't just appear in the middle of the night to share such tales. Undeterred, the woman counters, suggesting that sometimes the truth is difficult to accept. Pressing further, Hudson demands to know the woman's identity. Unfazed, she sits calmly and poses a thought-provoking question to Hudson. She asks if the sheriff has ever made a promise, one she knew she could never keep. The woman then proceeds to share the poignant story of Will Rayner, yet another missing person. She tells the officer how the man had everything one could have. The scene then shifts to Will, Rayner who is under house arrest. He sits in front of a Ouija board with an ankle monitor. His hand brushes a picture off the table and he crouches down to pick it up. It turns out to be a photo of his girlfriend named Carol. He lovingly caresses the picture and sighs in despair. The scene then transitions to the past, depicting a time when they lived happily together. Carol is playing the piano when Will comes in, watching his girlfriend from afar. After a while he comes in grabbing a chair and sitting beside her. He shares his awe for her talent. As they are cheerfully conversing, Will's eyes land on some papers. He asks and Carol excitedly shares that they are blueprints for their dream house, a vision that resonates with Will. He passionately expresses his commitment to doing whatever it takes to make their dream a reality. However, a dark turn emerges when Carol discovers Will's involvement in drug dealing, leading to a heated confrontation. Will, desperate to salvage their relationship, pleads with her to trust him, vowing that he's doing it for the last time, and that they'll be free from the dangerous individuals involved. Unfortunately, the promised safety net crumbles when a drug deal goes horribly wrong. Held captive in their own home, Will and Carol meet a tragic fate. The dealers tie the couple up and threaten them at gunpoint. It turns out that Will lost the dealer's promised money, and they are here to teach him a lesson. After playing with the couple for a bit, they shoot poor Carol in the leg. Despite Will's desperate pleas, the night ends with Carol's heartbreaking demise. Back to the present, we see Will sleeping on the couch. He is awakened from his slumber by the ringing of a phone. Sighing, he picks up the call, and it turns out to be the police officer in charge of him. The officer tells him that he is checking up on him, but in truth, he just seems to be passing time. Mid-call, a co-worker comes in to give him a file and chastises him for not doing any work in the office. Will hears this through the phone and sighs again. He tries to ask the officer if there is an important reason for the call, but the officer just tells him to stay out of trouble. Isn't the man on house arrest? 
What trouble could he get into? Unless it is slipping and falling in the bathroom. Just then some female co-workers come in, and upon hearing the word, cake, the officer cuts the call abruptly. Now, all alone once more, Will becomes aware of unsettling noises in his house. Scared, he tries to warn the intruders, saying that he has a gun, but there seems to be no response. Trembling, he investigates the source and finds nothing apparent. As he is looking around, he sees the door in front of him close abruptly on its own. All of a sudden, the tap in the washroom also turns on mysteriously. He goes inside, and as he turns it off, the toilet flushes unexpectedly, making the poor man almost collapse face first with fright. The shower follows suit, activating by itself, yet Will discovers no one within the confined space. To his horror, he hears strange scribbling sounds from behind him and whips around. There he finds the words, you promised, ominously written on the mirror behind him. Terrified by the paranormal occurrences, Will hastily flees from the bathroom, desperately trying to make sense of the events. In a frantic attempt to seek help, he reaches out to his probation officer. However, the latter is busy partying with his colleagues and initially misses the incoming call. But the phone rings persistently and the officer finally comes over to pick it up. Will, agitated and fearing a haunting presence, urgently requests permission to leave his house. Jim is eventually swayed by Will's insistence on the severity of the situation. Reluctantly, Jim decides to go visit him. Just as the call cuts, Will spots a car parking nearby. Alarmed, he hides within his house. The occupants of the car, however, turn out to be the same individuals responsible for Carol's tragic fate. The dealers bang on his door menacingly. They shout at him and demand that Will open the door, intensifying the gravity of his predicament. Poor Will is now trapped between unseen ghosts and cold-blooded monsters. He holds his breath and tries to calm down, but the dealers refuse to leave. Helpless and cornered, Will reluctantly opens the door, allowing the dealers into his home. The men barge in and question Will about the money that he owes them. However, the latter has got no money. The inquiries about the missing money quickly escalate into blame, as the men accuse Will of jeopardizing their operation by getting arrested. Their leader Rob blames him, saying that he should have hidden the before the police intervened in disposing of his wife's body. Angered, Will curses at the man. Rob, seething with rage, strikes Will, sending him sprawling. He then instructs Ray, one of his lackeys, to restrain him. As Ray moves in to tie Will up, an unexpected turn of events occurs. The rope strangely ties itself around Ray's neck and tightens on its own, causing him to choke. He is then violently dragged away by an unknown force. Seizing the opportunity, Rob attempts to shoot Will, but a knife pierces the back of his head, resulting in his demise. Disoriented, Will is left to grapple with the unfolding chaos. In a panic, Will tries to clean up the aftermath, just as Jim, his probation officer, knocks on the door. How on earth would he explain all this? Hastily concealing the bodies, Will opens the door to a seemingly unsuspecting Jim, who jokingly inquires if he has been hiding lifeless bodies. Poor Jim is in for an unpleasant surprise. He notices the injury on Will's face that Will nonchalantly attributes to a mere cold sore. He then tells Jim that he has been seeing strange stuff happening. The officer, however, speculates that he might be suffering from cabin fever. He suggests that the extended isolation may be taking a toll on Will's mental well-being, causing hallucinations and paranoia to set in. He then gives a urine sample bottle to Will. As Jim is about to leave, the horrifying revelation occurs. The closet door flies open, and all the concealed corpses tumble out of it, plunging the scene into chaos. The screen goes black. The narrative then takes a chilling turn. In the subsequent scenes, it becomes apparent that Jim too, has met a grim fate. Overwhelmed by the tragic events unfolding around him, Will, in despair, points the gun at himself. Before he can shoot himself, Carol's spirit appears. It is unclear whether the spirit made him point the gun at himself or whether it is trying to stop him from doing the deed. Back at the police station, Sheriff Hudson, visibly frustrated and skeptical, dismisses the woman's stories as tall tales. She questions the woman's intentions, whether it's filing a report or engaging in some sick game. The woman, undeterred, boldly asks about Hudson's own secrets. Irritated, Hudson decides to fetch the paperwork suggesting that the woman can tell her stories to the blank pages in her future. In a tense exchange, the woman accuses Hudson of being a murderer. She talks about how she can still hear the screams of the sheriff's victim in her head. Hudson dismisses her as a psycho, refusing to entertain the woman's assertions. The mysterious woman continues to insist that she can see the dark truths of Hudson's past actions. She can still see how the poor victim fought for her life. In a fit of fury, Sheriff Hudson forcefully pushes the woman against the wall threatening her, saying that she knows nothing about Hudson. 
She vehemently declares the woman's stories to be nonsense, dismissing them as baseless. Unfazed by Hudson's skepticism, the woman insists that all the tales are true. Hudson, showing no concern, retorts that she doesn't care and asserts that the woman is under arrest for assaulting a police officer and filing a fake report. Hudson presses the woman hard against the wall, and the woman pleads that she can't breathe. All of a sudden, an enraged Hudson begins growling like a monstrous entity. She then dives in to lick the poor crying woman's tears, and after a moment steps away. The woman falls down and cries. She then vaguely mentions that they all know, referring to the missing people. Just then, the missing person's posters on the pin board start oozing blood. In an unexpected turn, the woman attempts to flee, but Hudson quickly whips around and shoots her, ultimately ending her life. Poor unlucky Winston becomes a horrified witness to this horrific scene. He happens to arrive just at that moment to find the lifeless body of the woman and an enraged Hudson with her gun pointed at it. The officer turns around to find him trembling and rolls her eyes, sighing in frustration and the scene cuts. The following day, Hudson disposes of the woman's body in a gruesome manner, chopping it into pieces and placing them in a Santa bag. In a shocking and eerie finale, Hudson sets the police station ablaze before leaving with the gruesome sack. The missing poster of the woman now appears on the pin board, adding an unsettling layer to the conclusion.